Abituela Condolce has supported Independent Tech News directly for five years. Be like Abituela Condolce. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 10th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline's Grandma's House, I'm Zara Lane. In Salt Lake City, Utah, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shane. I think this is the best way people can keep up to date and informed on the context of the technology and the world around us. This is a time in which that is more important than ever. So thank you for spending some time with us today. We are going to dive a little deep into the Nintendo Switch in a moment, but let's start with a few tech things you should know. AT&T is enabling its call protect service by default for all new lines in order to block robocalls. Yay! Call Protect blocks fraudulent calls. It also flags telemarketers as suspected spam and also lets users keep a personal block list of their own. The service has been free but needed to be enabled manually. AT&T says it will begin now turning it on by default, but any customer can opt out of Call Protect if they wish. Visa and Andreessen Horowitz are investigating a, uh, or sorry, are investing in fellow Libra Association member Anchorage Omnimetric Blockchain Security System. Something Tom can explain better than I will. Anchorage does not use usernames, passwords, and email addresses or phone numbers to secure its cryptocurrency transactions. Clients whitelist devices held by employees. A transcription, excuse me, transaction is reviewed by AI, that being artificial intelligence, and Anchorage staff for validity. Then a two-thirds quorum of coworkers must approve the transactions. Very human-based security. Tuesday, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross announced his department will start issuing licenses to sell to Huawei, quote, where there is no threat to U.S. national security, though we don't know which products will qualify. Apparently some will. Huawei will remain on the entity list. In a separate speech, Director of White House National Economic Council Larry Kudlow said non-security critical components would be allowed to be sold to Huawei for a limited time. So that makes it sound like eh, we'll let them get some prior parts for a little bit and see how it goes. Uh, this, of course, after a meeting with China on June 29th, when the U.S. president said that the restrictions would be eased is our first official follow up on those remarks. The U.S. FCC passed an order that lets federally recognized tribal nations claim unlicensed educational broadband services, or EBS, spectrum over their lands before competitive bidding begins. Qualifying organizations have 90 days to learn details, followed by a 60-day application window that starts December 10th. Mural.net, Muralnet, rather, .org has a system to help tribal nations navigate this process. Thanks to Deborah for pointing that out to us on Twitter. That's good Good to know. And uh, the link will be in the show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com if you need it. All right, let's talk a little bit about YouTube. What are they doing, Scott? Well, they announced changes to its copyright claim system, which seems maybe good just in the surface, but let's see what this is about. To manually file a copyright complaint or claim, now a user must include timestamps of the infringing material. This is actually going to help me a lot as a content creator, and I, I may explain why if we have time. Uh, repeated failure to provide accurate timestamps will lose you the right to the filing system. Respondents to claims can use YouTube's editing system to remove the offending parts or swap out music. The new rules do not affect automatic claims as a result of the content ID system. Yeah, so to me, it doesn't fix the biggest problem, which is content ID misidentifying things. But this is going to keep some abuse of the system uh, under control because you have to point to exactly what is offending. It also helps if you get a claim to be like, what are they talking about? Which part of my video of me, yeah. me talking do they think is copyright infringing? So you can narrow in on, on just those minutes and it'll help you edit it. In fact, YouTube says they want to create a one-click system. So if you say, oh, just take that part of my video out, you can just press a button and it'll do it automatically. Yeah. What I wish would happen and I hope it, what happens is it becomes easier for me as a creator to know the difference, to know when content ID has kicked in and done a thing. And when a manual takedown has happened, the language in the emails is a little different, but not that different. And it's hard to tell. So I did this recently where I ran, uh, we were talking about a story about a popular YouTuber doing kids content. We were talking about kids content on YouTube and YouTube kids changing stuff. And actually it's usually something we talk about on this show, but came up on my morning show. And as we discussed it, um, we showed part of this channel and not very long, just a little brief video clip 
of a game that we're playing or something. It's just a public channel, very popular channel, some kid named Ryan and his parents. And so we watched that for a second and then moved on. And as soon as I posted the YouTube video, boom, sniped out of midair, gone, down. You've you've ruined everyone's life, it said. It didn't say that, but it really <laughs> told me why and told me that it was infringing upon this particular material. Ryan so, can now not go to college. Because yeah, so, so I had to go back and I, there was even, it wasn't even audio. It was literally like a 20 second clip of video, which if anything is a promotion. We weren't down talking bad about yeah, it. It's also absolutely fair use. You were commenting Right. on the video and showing it as a part of your commentary. There's an educational use. You're not undermining uh, the commercial. Uh, there's the, you've, you've meet so many factors, but go yeah. ahead. Well, and that's why uh, offering timestamps to something like this does not solve the underlying problem, but it does at least give more context to certain things that could be disputed. Yeah, that's my thinking too. I mean, I, it's a step in the right direction, but I think Tom's right. It doesn't really solve the big problem because i think content id was in charge of of yelling at me about ryan yeah and not somebody who found it out That's so, so thing, fast. Yeah. yeah and they did it so quickly like it was right after i posted the video so i know it was content id plus i don't think they would have cared honestly if you'd ask ryan's family hey do you care if we do a 20 second non-sound <laughs> version of this thing to talk about the news story about your cool channel is that a problem they would say no even then though content id would catch it and i'd still be in hot water so it's such a double-edged sword i hate it yeah. Uh, well, the Raspberry Pi 4's USB-C port doesn't work <laughs> uh, with all charging cables, at least. It does work with some of them due to varying implementations of the USB spec. Here's, here's what seems to have happened. The Raspberry Pi's USB-C port shares a single resistor between two of its pins. Now, the spec calls for one resistor for each pin. Uh, for whatever reason, Raspberry Pi designed it like, well, this resistor can handle it. We're just going to let it handle these two pins. Unfortunately, that means e-marked USB-C charging cables meant for laptops fitted with USB-C Thunderbolt ports, like, say, the MacBook, have a chip that detects devices and manages power draw. These e-marked cables can sense that there's one resistor on both those pins and therefore identify the Raspberry Pi as an audio adapter accessory and don't send power. Uh, Raspberry Pi's Eben Upton told Tech Republic the issue will be fixed in a future board revision, but that means you're gonna either have to wait to buy a Pi 4 or swap out the board if you have one already. Uh, Ars Technica reports that that new board revision is expected in a few months. Uh, in the meantime, the workaround is to use a charger that works. Uh, Raspberry sells a charger and that one definitely works, but uh, you may have another charger that doesn't do the sensing. That's not as smart uh, as some chargers uh, and in which case it should work just fine. But this, this to me just points to the further evidence that the USB-C spec is a little bit of a mess in its implementation. Yeah. Uh, and, and Raspberry shouldn't, have been able to diverge from the spec and still call it USB-C, honestly. Well, that's yeah, big, yeah, yeah, the whole USB-C, Thunderbolt, what works, what doesn't. I mean, I've gotten used to, you know, I've got four cables in the trunk of my car because there's going to be an issue every so often. But, I, you know, the fact that I'm doing that is not normal. That's just what I'm doing because I got to work. Um, and I think, especially with the Raspberry Pi folks, the idea of being able to be very nimble for very cheap is is a is a huge selling point the the idea of having you know various cables that that may or may not work is totally counterproductive to the whole operation yeah and i um i've been a big fan of USB C since its implementation mostly just because the connector goes both ways it was like what apple did with lightning but but better because everyone's using it it was a much more you know industry standard sort of thing and it would power everything from, well, power and do video and do high speed data transfer and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like it's been this exciting advancement in IO. And then you hear about how messy it's been with people adhering to the spec. Uh, it just bums me out because I love to charge every, I love to be able to go, well, I need my switch charge. Cool. No problem. Cause here's my MacBook charger. It's already plugged in. I'm going to use that. And oh, guess what else? The controllers need charging and slowly getting rid of micro usbs which really are the worst things ever made and let's get you know get to this cool new standard but to find out this stuff is kind of a kind of a bummer well and you're a raspberry pi 3 user right 
Uh, I have a two. A um, two. Okay. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, I mean, I, is this going to make you wait even longer? <laughs> to, yeah, I'll wait for the revision because yeah. I want the raspberry, the next raspberry Pi I get, I want to go nuts with an arcade uh, thing I want to build. And I'm, I'm definitely not going to get it until they've said they've done the revision. Um, I don't want to use anybody else's. There's some Arduino stuff. There's some other brands I could go with, but I really like Raspberry Pi. So I think I'll wait until they revise it. Yeah. Let's talk about Lord of the Rings. Specifically, Amazon Game Studios announced it's developing a Lord of the Rings MMO in partnership with Leu's Athlon Games. It'll be a free-to-play title for PCs and also consoles. This is the same game that Athlon announced last year as being developed with an unnamed partner. Now, last year, Athlon described the game as being set long before the events of Lord of the Rings with people and creatures never seen before by fans of the Tolkien universe. The description is similar to an upcoming Lord of the Rings TV show being developed for Amazon Prime Video. Mm. So I have a lot to say on this. And the main thing is there's a there's one community that's a little bit up in arms about this. And we can discuss or not why, if they should be or shouldn't be. But fans of the existing Lord of the Rings MMO called Lord of the Rings Online or Lotro by people who play it has been out since 2007 and has a pretty robust, it's not the biggest MMO on the market, but a pretty, pretty robust following. Um, this is a game that started as a subscription game, went free to play later, and is still a thing people can play today. They, them hearing that, oh, someone's going to take this IP and make a whole nother game from a whole nother studio with a whole nother partnership. To, to them, it sounds like it's happening on another planet and they had no say in the, in the matter. But if you get away from that a little bit and look at what's actually happening here, this is Amazon's first actual rubber on the road game project that we can look at and go this might actually get finished and done there's been a few false starts been a few little studios internally that were working on stuff that went away uh but amazon game studios was a big deal when it got announced there was a lot of money a lot of back end acquisition of twitch like there's a lot of stuff in their favor and now that we're going to finally get something having it being based on a big ip like this is kind of cool like i personally am excited but i'm also not invested in in lord of the rings online which will presumably continue there's no sign of that ending. So I, I guess we can just decide which one we like better players and everyone will be okay with it. I, yeah. I don't, I, I sometimes fail to sympathize with people who are not having anything taken away from them being mad that something else is being added somewhere else, uh, which is what seems to be going on here. Uh, yeah. Perhaps they should be calling this a middle earth MMO. If it's taking place long before the events of Lord of the Rings, then it's not really Lord of the Rings, right? Right. People um, and creatures, not even the same. Yeah. And, and that's the same with the prime video. So this is going to be different creatures, different characters, different locations than Lotro and Lotro will continue to be, you know, set in the world as described in the, the three novels of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So I, I don't see that that's a problem. On the other hand, I can get where like, oh, I want to have access to all of the Lord of the Rings game. And I thought I did by being a Lotro subscriber. And now there's going to be this other thing I have to subscribe to. So here's what I suggest. A meta game that uh, rules all of the MMOs <laughs> and in the darkness binds them. Can we so call it the ring? <laughs> Just the yeah. ring? Okay. All right. I think that's not a bad idea. The thing is, uh, Turbine, who started the game, it's now a different developer who even runs it. There have been six publishers. We're now at Daybreak Games, started at Turbine. Like, that's a weird place right now. But also, let's just not forget, MMO players are a very distinct brand of gamer. They are very dedicated to the thing that they've sunk hundreds of hours into and possibly a lot of money. And so I kind of get where they're coming from. Um, it's the kind of business that drives people to be very protective and very uh, careful about this. So... Anyway. One subscription to bring them all, one subscription to find them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and and your point, Tom, is like nothing is being taken away from anybody, you know, so the outrage is not necessarily warranted. Like, I totally agree. At the same time, I, I think, OK, well, the Lord of the Rings franchise maybe wouldn't get me upset, but if I think of it being Star Wars, you know, it's like someone's like, well, there's just people and creatures that were like even a longer time ago and farther away you know i might be like well what no that's not new you're ruining it that's the old republic if the old republic mmo uh was still popular and then you had uh more popular than it is i guess and then you had somebody create an mmo set in the force awakens universe with the people in the old republic exactly yeah it's like who are you to do this right. um, yeah. but uh i don't know it sounds like a fun game 
Yeah, it should be. I'm, I mean, new tech. It's Amazon finally gets to strut their stuff and see what yeah, the I'm yeah. excited about it. Speaking of strutting their stuff, Android Q Beta 5 launched Wednesday for Pixel devices. It's the fifth of six beta releases that we expect to see before the final. Android Q uses gestures. If you didn't realize this already, they talked about this at I.O. So they're replacing back home and recent apps with three new gestures. Beta 5 adds another gesture, swipe up from either corner to launch Google Assistant. Uh, so there are some other button like long press stuff that need to be replaced. This is one of them. Uh, you'll get two L shaped indicators appearing in the corner in some cases to kind of guide you in the swipe. Uh, also the back gesture has been swipe in from the side. Uh, but that conflicted with swiping this from the side to get the navigation panel. They had a solution for that that included like two swipes, but they've changed it in beta five. You can now tap on the side to get the nav drawer to peek out, then slide the nav drawer out. So sliding from the side is just the back gesture now. Uh, this is a change from the way they announced it to Google I.O. And some developers are a little miffed about that because they've been designing their apps to accommodate this new Android Q gesture that they've now changed. Google also announced that its gesture system will not work with third party home screen launchers at the launch of Android Q. Uh, virtual buttons will appear in those cases, although Google does plan to fix that issue after the launch of Android Q. If you use a third-party home screen launcher, uh, you won't be able to take advantage of the gestures on it at launch. Wow. I mean, I <clears throat> I guess this, uh, <laughs> we've been on this path for a while with phone, phone makers, and certainly Google's one of them, trying to, and, and the software side of it, trying to figure out a way to get rid of home buttons. No more buttons. Let's have as few buttons as possible. Let's use all our screen real estate. And turns out that's hard. There's difficulty on the road. Yeah, I, I actually like gesture systems. Uh, and, I, and I think Google's doing, generally speaking, a very good job of implementing it. I actually like the tap for the nav drawer much better than what they had before, where you had to kind of remember how many slight swipes you'd done. This is this is a much better. So I, I'm glad they changed it. On the other hand, I get the frustration of like, really, we went through four betas with that way. So we're designing our apps and now you change it like right near the end, but better now uh, than I guess in the sixth beta. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes. Oh, sorry, Sarah. Oh, we lost. Oh, it's Sarah. okay. Um, I was just I was just gonna say oh you did. <laughs> yeah, we uh we got a little bit of lag on Sarah's line. So uh we, we will catch up uh with you in a second. But folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Nintendo announced the new Switch Mini handheld game console. A lot of people are like, hey, it could also be called the Switch Lite or the Lite Switch. Get it? Like, mm. uh, the Switch Mini is what it's really called. It has a 5.5 inch screen. So it's a little bit smaller than the original Switch's 6.2 inch screen. Also slightly lighter, uh, 0.61 pounds versus the original's 0.88 pounds. Controllers are not removable. And there's a typical D-pad now, instead of you know, with, with the Joy-Cons that came off, you kind of had to adapt uh, how those buttons work. Since they're not gonna come off on the mini, you, they gave you back your D-pad. Uh, it does have a USB-C port, but that port will not support a TV output or TV dock. Uh, the Switch Mini also doesn't have a kickstand, which part of me has wondered why they didn't do that. I guess for cost maybe, but if it's meant to be mobile, the kickstand would be kind of cool. Uh, Nintendo claims the Switch Mini will get 20 to 30% more battery life than the original. So uh, that would uh, equate to about three to seven hours of battery life, depending on what you're playing. Switch Mini goes on sale September 20th for $200 in yellow, gray, or blue. Scott, are you excited? I am super excited. Now, Let's just say this. Okay, let me let me go back a little bit. Big fan of the Switch. Love it. It's been a huge success for Nintendo. It was the right thing at the right time. A gigantic comeback from the otherwise disappointing, uh, disappointing Wii U generation, if you want to even call it that. And uh, they've done nothing but great things with it. Uh, this is exactly what Nintendo does. They iterate in this way. They'll have a very successful device, especially in the handheld market. They did this with the Nintendo DS many years ago and was very successful out of the gate. And then I, I don't remember long, how long it was, a year or two later, roughly the kind of time frame we're looking at here, they come out with the DS Lite. And the DS Lite was arguably the best clamshell de design of any handheld they ever made. It was really, really great. Everything got smaller, tighter, better. Um, some online capability came later. 
but it was just a great iteration of that device. They do this all the time. They've done it with Game Boys all the way up till current. And the big difference here is that the Switch and even the name Switch means, or at least how it was described previously, and the way you would use these things, it meant, okay, I can switch between handheld <clears throat> and a television-based, you know, regular old home console. That's going away, yet it's still called the Switch. I don't actually have a problem with that, but I think people really should know the difference. You're not going to be able to connect this to your TV, at least not anytime soon. If they come up with a way to AirPlay style something, or if they're going to make a, a USB, uh, uh, if they're going to make the spec for USB output for video in the, in the base unit, they could do that. They haven't said that. It sounds like they're just focusing on the portability of this device, which leads me to think that they just see this as the successor to the 3DS and they've kind of merged their products. That's probably very smart and all good. Uh, all of that being said, I have a Switch. Um, this Switch I have is great. I have no problems with it. It has a bigger screen. Uh, it has a lot more versatility. I can stream it. I can capture from it. I can do all the things that I want to do. I will not be able to do those things with this new one, but I still want one. So mm -hmm. here's what I hope they do. This is the number one thing I want. Um, they And they haven't been real clear about this because it's a different question, but their services are getting beefed up all the time. Nintendo not known for the best internet prowess when it comes to like features and friends lists and you know services if they're really going to beef those up and one of those is reported to be way better cloud syncing of your saves then this thing becomes a lot more palatable to people like me because i just soon leave this thing in the dock and take one of these new like a yellow one because those look really cool take that thing with me wherever i go um which will have a better d-pad on it as you mentioned and sync with my saves then there's no reason why i can't jump back and forth as it stands right now, if I had two switches, that's a huge pain in the butt, and it's not universal across the device the way Steam or PlayStation is or even Xbox with their cloud saving. So to me, that's the big kicker for those of us who already own one. I'll get one because I need to do it for what I do. But for a lot of people out there that you've already got a switch and you're already getting all you want out of it, I think this isn't for you. This is for people who either held off on the first one because of price or whatever reason, or parents who are like, I'm not going to let my kid tear this thing apart, rip controllers off and on, throw it around. What happened to the Joy-Con on the left? I don't know. Here's another 70 bucks to replace it. Like, it's kind of a nightmare from a parent's perspective with the current Switch. This new thing, way more solid state, one decent package. It's a lot like the 2DS that they made. Uh, that's a huge win, and it's less money. So I think this is going to be a huge win for them because it pulls in parts of the market that perhaps were on the sidelines on this. But if you're already a Switch owner, there is not a lot here other than cool, hot, new thing that's a little thinner uh, with all of those caveats I mentioned before. I do wonder why, if there is a cost to allowing the TV output. I wonder if you could sell this exact Switch Mini, allow USB-C to send TV out, and just not give you the dock so that you're like, hey, if, if you want to hey, take an adapter and go USB-C to HDMI, you can do that. Uh, I, I, I wonder about that. But otherwise, I look at this and I, I see people complaining and they're mostly people who already own a switch. So what they're complaining about is, hey, I can't get the exact same switch I have now for less money. Uh, which, <laughs> you know, OK, that's that's fair. Uh, but I, I don't think that's all this is. The, and people in our chat room are nailing it right now. This is for first timers, like right. you said, Scott, or somebody who just couldn't afford the $300 and the $100 price drop is just enough for them. Or somebody, I'll be honest, like me, I rarely played my Switch on the TV anyway. I plugged, I put it in the dock mostly to charge. Uh, I really just used it on the go. And I almost never took the Joy-Cons off, except when I did the cardboard stuff. So... Uh, this, if I were doing it all over again, this, this might be fine. Well, that's a really good point. The, I don't know, I don't have this data, but I know Nintendo does. All I have is empirical data from my friends and people who I follow who use switches. Almost nobody I know is a docked only switch owner and only a couple of them occasionally dock. And those are doing it because they want to stream, but most of their playtime where they're just playing for themselves, just the good old fun of having a switch they're doing it in portable mode. They're taking it on plane trips. They're using it in bed. They're just using it like a portable because it's excellent for that. And the versatility is great. Don't get me wrong. I really love the idea that you can kind of go back and forth. But I'll bet they've got data that shows that millions of owners are primarily using it as a handheld device. And as such, they should service that. They should have a revision that services that. They should have 
a, a path for that. And that's what this is. So there are going to be some, they're going to be outliers, but they're going to be some who are like, man, I never even take this thing off. I'm going to pass this down to my nephew and I'm going to get that new one. Cause I only use it as portable anyway. This is perfect for me. And they'll get the hot new slim, you know, newer design, whatever, got a good D pad on it for once, that sort of thing. They're going to get all of that and maintain the main reason they like their switch, which is this is my portable gaming device. So, so I actually think that that data is not only interesting, but it's good. Nintendo's responding to it. Um, again, I made that up whole cloth cause I don't really know if this data exists, but, uh, how you'd even know if somebody was plugged in or not is almost impossible, but everybody I talked to you included used it way more in handheld mode. I do than I do in any other mode and they're responding to it and they look really cool. And those colors are rad. Like they've got it going on. I then that's the other reason people are mad, Tom. I want to at least give them a little tiny bit of a, a an edge there and say they all just want what an awesome new cool thing Nintendo makes. They're a little like Apple fans. Yeah. They want the hot new thing. And so they're feeling the burn of like, oh, but it's not as good as the thing I have. And so I think we're seeing that come out, but really they just want the hot newness. They're completionists. Yeah. They're like, but I want the new thing in my life. <laughs> Gotta catch them all, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, you know, Pokemon, it's right there in the Nintendo verse. So. Yeah. The other, oh, one other huge advantage I almost forgot to mention before we uh, end this is uh, 20 to 30 percent more battery life is what Nintendo's claiming. That is huge for portable. Well, if you're gonna make it mobile, right? That makes sense that you yep. that you'd want to focus on that. To me, that's worth the loss of screen space. That's worth the loss of some of this fertility, uh, uh, versatility or fertility. I don't know. To hold it in your lap. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, there's eggs in the Super Mario, right? <laughs> uh the the one last point i want to make uh before we wrap this up uh people in the chat room are pointing out you can just play mobile games and with google stadia we were talking with patrick beja about all these streaming options that can turn whatever device you have into a game uh console and you can you can now use playstation and xbox controllers with ios devices for goodness sake uh why would you want to buy a switch mini and and it comes down to because you want nintendo games and while nintendo is slowly rolling out some mobile games off platform they're always different they're always meant specifically for mobile. Uh, and if you want to play Super Mario, if you want to play Legend of Zelda, you're, you're going to have to get a Switch. That's their that's their 100%. 100%. The content is king for Nintendo. They know that. They get a premium for it. And you can't get them anywhere else. So all those other ideas sound nice. But you ain't getting Breath of the Wild sequel or any of the stuff Nintendo makes, which you, know, you could argue is some of the greatest games ever made. So good luck to you. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Nintendo stories are welcome, as well as anything else tech that uh, strikes your fancy and you want us to, to look at. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook if you'd like to join our group and haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. I see there's something in the mailbag. Oh, you're right. Huh. Okay. Let's look at it, l l open it up here. Uh, this one comes from Norm. And Norm says, hey, guys, I heard on GDI, good day, Internet, and you mentioned getting credits for signing or following on Twitch because we're streaming on Twitch now. I'd love to do that, says Norm, especially if it doesn't cost me anything. I did a quick try, but I couldn't do it quickly. Maybe you could do a little bit of an explainer. Yeah. Okay. So background, GDI or good day, Internet is the show we do live on Twitch every day uh, before DTNS, including DTNS and after DTNS. And that show is made available as an audio podcast to patrons at patreon.com slash DTNS. Now, if you're watching on Twitch and you want to support that account for free, uh, you can get a Twitch account, get an Amazon Prime account if you don't already have one, but this is probably for people who already have one. Go to twitchprime.com, click to connect your Amazon account to your Twitch account. And then when you go to twitch.tv slash goodayinternet, you can choose subscribe for free, or if you're in the UK, subscribe at no additional cost. And uh, they will take money from themselves out of Jeff Bezos' pocket and give it to us. It won't cost <laughs> you anything. Uh, you do have to manually renew that every 30 days. They don't auto renew the Prime subscriptions, but it's a way to help us out uh, without... Uh, basically, it's taking money out of big tech and giving it to us. Think of Jeff Bezos, though. Yeah. Mm, I think he's Who will think right. of Jeff Bezos? <laughs> right. Poor Jeff. Mm. Yeah. No, no, if, you do, if you feel too bad for Jeff, don't do this. Otherwise... Yeah, yeah, and and yes, and I'm being facetious, of course. Yes. Look, uh, red bumper taxi did it just now. Woo-hoo! Um, 
Nice. Um, yeah, thanks everybody who who's participated in, in our Twitch channel. Uh, it's really fun to see everybody there. And thanks, Norm, for the question. Hopefully, we answered. Um, and if anybody else has more, please send them in. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us. Happy Hump Day, Scott. Where do oh. people find out where you're doing all your good work? Well, if they want to find me and my cool, horribly made Super Mario Maker 2 levels, speaking of the Switch, they can <laughs> find that on Twitter over at Scott Johnson. But also the website's where it's at. All the shows I do, all the artwork I do, everything that's going on is there. I actually have a card game coming out. I have uh, samples on their way that is a brand new from the ground up design card game. Never done one before. Was dying to do one. Did all the art, the design, the game rules, all of it. Uh, I'll soon have samples on that. So follow that project over at frogpants.com or on Twitter at Scott Johnson. And you may uh, may want to get one. I think they're going to be pretty rad. Uh, lots of stuff like that happening. And thanks for having me on as always. Of course. Now, Sarah, I, I know people are wondering, uh, we got your lag fixed. What were you going to say? When? Before the lag cut you off. I don't know. No idea. Okay. <laughs> there you go, folks. It really wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, if you want to get uh, an early uh, look at an interview I did with Professor Leposky uh, about e-waste, uh, it's in your Patreon right now. If you're already a patron, you got it in your Patreon RSS feed. Go check it out, or you can go to patreon.com slash DTNS, scroll back uh, and find it, or become a patron and help support independent tech news directly. Do a little more of that funneling of dollars away from the big companies into the small companies uh, and become a member and get all kinds of other member perks at patreon.com slash DTNS. Hey, if you want to send us an email and be part of our mailbag crew, well, guess what? I have an email address for you and it's feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com we're also live monday through friday 4 30 p.m eastern 2030 utc find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with justin robert young talk to you then this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program <laughs>